we can do hard things. We nimbly responded to a global interruption with compassion and grace. We showed ourselves that we could learn and stretch and grow at lightning speed. And we didn't go it alone. We reached out across the continent, around the country, over the river, person to person, helping one another figure it out. We did the best we could. And the things we couldn't do just didn't get done. We were imperfect. And this is an especially helpful lesson because we remembered how to be gentle with one another. And we're gonna need that again and again. So we wanna reinforce this muscle memory, the compassionate imperfection that got us through. And we practiced being wrong without being defensive. There was only immediacy and how can we do this thing? No looking for the reasons that we couldn't. It was a global manifestation of mindfulness to be present in the moment, not the past, not the future, in the moment. And now the moment stretches on and on. And we have time to catch our breath, time to choose what comes next with a little more intention and planning, time to learn about accessibility, to learn from the pandemic experiences, to be more self-aware because we are reminded of our value, of the power and the promise of our collective strength. Now, we know that we can do hard things nimbly if we have to. We know that we can make our way carefully through difficulty. And we know that we love and miss one another with a profound, almost insatiable ache. During this global crisis, lives and livelihoods have been torn apart. People have faced devastating circumstances, both from the virus and its effects, from the loneliness and isolation and the many insecurities unleashed or amplified by disaster. Health threats, economic crisis, political instability, racism and police brutality, the surging rise of blatant extremism, marginalization of all kinds, continuing climate devastation, all combined this year like a vice squeezing our planet. We are exhausted. We are worn thin by worry and loss, by heartache and fear. We are frustrated and disappointed. We are militant and angry. And at the same time, there is a spark of renewal because there is the learning. In every crisis is the revelation of deeper truths. When face to face with our most vulnerable selves, we learn things that we cannot unknow. In crisis is the potential for transformation. We know those stories may already have lived one of going through some tragedy and finding within ourselves some seed of knowing, some spark of light, some clarity of vision. Last spring, the simple act of planting tomato seeds, nurturing them until they could be moved outside, felt like a fragile declaration, I dare to live long enough to harvest this fruit. I am fortunate to have lived to harvest and to preserve and to eat the fruit all winter, to still be here now for another planting season. When people survive a tragedy, there is a lot to heal, a lot to reconcile. There is a world of meaning to be made. We'll each approach this in different ways, but the one thing we will all be is changed. With life under a pressurized microscope, we have had time to look at what is stuck and what is broken. If we're honest, we probably knew before this year 
But clearly now we are acutely aware that the pandemic did not impact people equally, that justice isn't just, that our crises are bigger than the virus, and that our work is both personal and collective. Our institutions, our congregations, our community ministries have faced profound challenges. And while many of our organizations are still upright, like us, it is with a definite lean. COVID took a lot. And some things in our lives and in our organizations were broken from before. So we all need healing and we need renewal because renewal is what follows an interruption. Renewal will be the next right thing. One risk is that we equate the pain we feel over past mistakes with the idea that we are broken or failed people. In the book, Who Do We Choose to Be? Margaret Wheatley writes, we are not broken people. It's our relationships that need repair. It's relationships that bring us back to health, wholeness, holiness. Health is found in working with the strengths already present and creating new connections. Like ourselves, our organizations and institutions are ripe for reform and renewal, ready to draw strength from the past, trust the lessons of the present, and work for a brighter future. So often, the interruption, the call to reform, must come from the margins. People who cannot seem to make their way in despite our insistence that the doors are open. And we have not always gone gracefully into these conversations. Let's take the lessons of the pandemic, that we can be interrupted without getting defensive, that we can shift and do hard things, that we can stop looking for reasons to resist and instead simply ask ourselves, how can we do these things? Let us work together to get there faster. Let's volunteer our discomfort by interrupting our own selves, not requiring marginalized peoples to continue to carry the burden of educating our minds and opening our hearts and transforming our ways of being in the world. Let's us skip the part where there has to be another level of crisis, skip the fake fights and the territory defending. We've lost enough already had enough pain and suffering. Let's go right to surrender, to volunteering for the work of redemption, to love. The UU Ministers Association calls us forth to courageous and transformative ministries empowered by love, committed to collective liberation because we need one another. The heartbeat message of the Canadian Unitarian Council is that our interdependence calls us to love and justice. The Commission on Institutional Change report widening the circle of concern reminds us that our theology must be liberatory if it is to be relevant, if we are to bring benefit to the world. That report contains this quote from Aisha Hauser while she was accepting the Angus H. McLean Award in 2018. These are her words. The next call to action for racial justice has arrived. My people, will we answer? The UU white supremacy teach-in movement was unprecedented in its scope and it was just the beginning of a crucial conversation. This conversation has angered some and empowered others. It is for the first time, an honest conversation. What is at stake is the heart and soul of Unitarian Universalism. We are a people of faith, a faith that demands of us reflection, determination, and yes, a commitment to justice. Centering the voices of the marginalized will be part of becoming whole as a faith and as a people. 
If a person had any doubts about whether this report has relevance in Canada, the CUC Dismantling Racism Report will quickly put them to rest. On a chart tracking racist behaviors in our congregations, noticing, experiencing, or hearing of racist behaviors was typically between 50 to 100% higher among people of color than white people. More than 20% of white respondents noticed pushback against racial justice work, while more than 40% of people of color did. Over 30% of the people of color noticed, experienced, or heard of marginalization, while 12 to 13% of white respondents did. This is raw data. The chart doesn't differentiate between noticing, experiencing, or hearing of, and those are very different things. And it doesn't tell us frequency. One person might notice racism once, another could be experiencing multiple events. There is a place for every one of us in shifting and healing this reality. From widening the circle of concern again, the Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt says, we are the theological inheritors of teachings on universal salvation. There is no winnowing out of the supposedly unworthy that can be named sacred among us. It is our very unit universalism that is at stake when we turn away from the impact that our institutions have on the same communities and groups that society encourages us to dehumanize and make small. Do you remember in 2015 when newly elected Prime Minister Trudeau sent mandate letters to his cabinet ministers with commitments to renew the relationship between Canada and Indigenous people. The letter to Dr. Carolyn Bennett, then Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs said, this renewal must be a nation to nation relationship based on recognition, rights, respect, cooperation and partnership to make real progress on the issues most important to First Nations, the Métis Nation and Inuit communities to support the work of reconciliation and continue the necessary process of truth-telling and healing, to implement recommendations of the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission, starting with the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Reconciliation is an empty promise when actions don't back it up. In a workshop led by Indigenous leader Miranda Jimmy from RISE Edmonton, Jimmy shared that while she doesn't believe reconciliation to be dead, it does feel like it's dying. So let's interrupt this cycle. Let's refuse to be people of empty promises. Let's trust the leadership of the people most impacted who call us into relationship. Let's answer the call and honor their faithful perseverance. There are many ways we can learn to interrupt ourselves to take on this reconciliatory work. One is to notice when we write people off as unworthy, when we insult someone, draw lines between us and them, or insist that someone isn't worth our effort. Our work is to see the inherent worth of every person to embody universalism. Here's another. We're learning a new practice at Westwood. Ren, a facilitator from Pyros, the Prairie Youth Radical Organizing School, taught us that when you misgender someone, when you incorrectly attribute pronouns, and someone in the room is brave enough to correct you, instead of saying sorry, try saying thank you. This lifts the burden of consolation off the corrector. They won't experience the same pressure to reassure you that it's okay, like they might if you apologize. Instead, when we say thank you, we express gratitude for the reminder, recognizing that they risked their comfort on our behalf and that we benefited from their help. A correction is a gift. It means that we are still in conversation. 
It means the injury wasn't left to hang in the air, that the speaker hopes not only that we are capable, but also that we are willing to learn. When we practice saying thank you instead of sorry, we are saying yes. Transition is intimidating. Volunteering to transform ourselves again after experiencing this pandemic and its burdens may feel overwhelming. But there is a more compelling truth. When someone belongs to a marginalized community, there is no rest, no break. They don't get to catch their breath before choosing whether or not to face the next trauma. They face harm every day. Our call is to move into the space between privilege and marginalization, to spend more time arguing for income security and affordable housing than we do on administrative details, to learn the history of our land before colonization, to build relationships beyond our comfortable circles, to risk making mistakes and failing. Wouldn't it be easier to interrupt ourselves, to listen to the teachings, rather than to wait for someone else to have to call us to account again? White supremacy culture has trapped us into a vicious cycle of competition, isolation, and criticism with hollow promises and bitter results. We have been invited to interrupt a set of learned behaviors and practices that in reality harm everyone. If we use our curiosity, our ability to learn, our freshly dusted cooperative skills, and our compassionate imperfection, we can create an excellent learning space. We can flip problems into possibilities. If we will resist the temptation of comfort that calls us back to the safe familiarity of old ways, if we will instead align ourselves with the integrity of our values, we have a chance to build a vital future. The answer to, what if we were wrong when called into repair is always some measure of yes. The invitation is not the problem, it's the possibility. Your third invitation is to read and make use of these documents. The CUC's Dismantling Racism Study Group National Survey, Widening the Circle of Concern, Widening the Circle of Concern Study Guide. Thank you for joining this conversation. I hope to see you on Zoom on May 14th for the Confluence Conversation, following the opening ceremonies of the Canadian Unitarian Council Conference. This year, rather than listen to the lecture, which you now have already heard or read, we will have a live introduction, a short summary, and a conversation about the material. See you there. Do that thing. <laughs>